All right, who do we have in front of us here? We have, and let me pronounce this correctly now, because I pronounced Anita wrong. I said Anita, that's how you say it in Swedish. So it's Daniels Pavlutz, Minister of Health. Welcome. Uh, and we have this kind of musical theme going on. I know that you also are a musician. Or, uh, isn't that correct? Yes, I was yeah. trained as a classical pianist and I actually was a classical pianist for a while. Yeah, you were, right? Yeah, so, so perhaps there's something there in the learning of, of, of music. It, there well. is something about the quality of the brain that comes out of this process. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then we have uh, Professor Ruta Muktu. Muktupavela, is that Excellent. correct? Yes. Excellent. Oh. <laughs> You've done it. <laughs> I'm working on it. Uh, you're the chair of the Council of Rectors in Latvia. Yes. Uh, music interest? Since we are already talking yes, about sure. that. Yes, sure. I'm, yeah? I'm a singer. You're a singer? If you allowed me, I, I will try. Yeah, probably <laughs> yeah, after the we'll, session. We we'll can see if we can <laughs> Be find Be careful. <laughs> yeah. We'll do something. For, uh, and then Gert has his guitar with him, I hope. Yeah, we can, as well. We can do something. Awesome. Uh, we have uh, Professor Marcis. Auzins, is that correct? Auzins, okay, sorry, yes. Um, uh, physicist, former rector and professor of the University of Latvia. Also, in, yes, your hand, of course. Yay. Thank you. Uh, quantum mechanics seems to be your thing. It's a very creative, actual subject. Mm. It is, right? It is. It's so it strange is. because, you know, we can be on two places at once no, and it's also... No, wrong. it's not strange, it's creative. <laughs> it's creative, not strange. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, we have Professor Tale Schölsvik from uh, Norway as well. Welcome. Um, Vice Dean and Faculty of Technology, Art and Des Technology, Art and Design. Yep. That is interesting. All yeah. of those things. Mm -hmm. How come? Residual of everything else at the university. Actually. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In the Oslo Mes Metropolitan University, right? Uh, if I remember. And then we have Slata, Elsina, and then I. Oh, the last. Oh, help me out. What is Zashirinska. it? Zashiritsa. Okay, thank you. Chairman of Foreman Investors Council in Latvia. Hi. Uh, you, you, I mean, I, I just said that everyone can be part of the panel, but, but you are here with me now as, as guests here. So we will, we will have a discussion based on what we just heard. So I would like to ask you perhaps the same question. What made you, I will ask all of you the same question here. What made, made you hopeful or scared or happy? How about we start with you and we go all the way around. Tala, you first. I'm hopeful because humans are really important going forward and I'm a little bit scared because I know that we have very limited minds and a lot of mental maps that we need to deal with to kind of embrace the future. I, I, I just heard limited minds say, what did you say <laughs> about the hopeful part? The hopeful part is that it's about us. It's not about the technology, it's all about us. It, it is about us, okay, okay, and then we'll see, okay. But with limited capacity, we'll see where we end up. Is that why we're here? Okay. Hey. Mm. Uh, see if we can explore that a little bit. Uh, what do you say? We could go on. Uh, probably I'm a little bit scared that uh, responsibility for education is given too much to professionals in education. It sounds a little bit, I guess, uh, provocative. Uh, and hopeful that I see that more and more people from uh, industry, from, from creative arts, are coming uh, to education, have been interested in education, in, in education and have uh, contributed to, to create a modern educational system. If we will have this balance between professionals and education and people from other walks of uh, life, then uh, I think that we have chance to create really uh, effective system of education. So there is hope? Definitely. Okay, good, yeah. I mean, I, I, I actually, I live in Sweden and, and uh, don't follow Sweden. <laughs> no, don't, <laughs> please don't, it, it's, not, it's not good. It might be, but it's not today at least. Uh, okay, will you sing this uh, thing or will you No, I will, <laughs> I will try to, to, all right, to speak. Yeah. But uh, my, most of all, I'm uh, very thankful for, for, to both keynote speakers for, for reminding us that uh, machines are good, but uh, humans still, still matter. And, uh, and uh, it made me happy indeed because I'm a representative of, of culture and arts, you know. I'm a rector of Academy of Culture of Latvia, so it's really, it was very, um, hopefully for me. So thank you. All right, okay, so, so humans Once still matter, again. which is kind yes. of good for us. Yes, yes, probably we, 
somehow we can manage our future uh, looking not through the eyes of, of computers still, but still we, we, we would have our own eyes and opinions and, and everything uh, what, uh, what uh, we are about. Mm. All right, thank you. Thank you. Moving on, what, what made you scared or hopeful or happy? Well, it's kind of both. Uh, I think that my, my state is best described by the quote that uh, Mr. Leonard provided by Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci, that uh, I'm intellectually pessimistic, but there is optimism of will. Uh, it's certainly both. And, and it, both sides of the coin are really part of the same. It's Xin yang. It's on one hand, the problem and, and, and the apprehension I have is because of the human nature, because of the darker sides of human nature, how we psychologically are seem to be incapable, adjust fast enough to the exponential growth of technology and possibilities. And the other, the opposite is also true. It's the human nature, it's the humanity. We got this far, we will probably survive the technology that uh, we have created and probably make uh, this a better place. And kids will teach us, hopefully. Yeah, kids so, thank you, Mr. Polonet. Yeah. That's an important point. That was, it was a good, good one. It was probably the biggest element of hope is that kids will probably teach us back. So it's about reverse education. So the whole education system will be based on a they teach us from now on. That's, that's good. I actually tried to teach my, my 81-year-old dad to open an SMS. It didn't work. But, but, <laughs> so, so yeah, depends on, on the age, perhaps. What made you hopeful, scared, happy? Yeah, um, I think for me was um, the reflection was more on us as a human. Yeah, we are looking on ourselves as a solvers, but solvers has a lot of different skill sets underneath. And I think for me, the hope and the fear probably is coming from the same things. How to be visionary and be solvers at the same time, how not to lose the touch with reality and stay there at the moment and bring this moment through the small changes which we're doing in ourselves due sort of in the course of our life. They talked a lot about, at least my understanding was, they talked a lot about being masters of your own destiny somehow. Uh, that, that it is still within our hands. No, no one else will fix it for us. No computer will fix it for us. We still have to be the ones handling it. Uh, but if you look at it from a, from a real future now, not, not what we do today, not on our to-do lists, you know, pick up laundry or, or learn these two new words in Latvian, whatever it is. If we look at it far away, let us try to, to imagine now that we are 20 years in the future, for instance. 20 years. We, we have the best education system in the world right here. Perhaps also in Norway, perhaps also in Norway, but, but we, we talk about here right now. Uh, and then other, other, other countries come to you, other people come to you from other countries and they say, oh, we are um, inspired by you, perhaps envious of you. What is going on here with all the learning and the teaching and the education system to support all that? What are you doing that is so amazing? What would be your answer then? And you can answer from a Norwegian perspective if you want to. That's okay. <laughs> but what would be your answer then if, if, if you can just dream now? We don't have it. We don't know the, what will happen in 10, 20 years. We don't know. But if everything goes really good and, and we don't have anyone uh, pressing the atomic bomb button or anything like that, if everything goes really good, what, what is it that you have done right then, 20 years from now? Who would not want to ask that, that question? Yes? I think it's simple. It's simple. Yes. Okay, good, cool. <laughs> Tell us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and with all the educational leaders here, and political leaders, and all sorts of leaders here in the room, I think the answer was provided uh, today during the keynote speeches that if we simply figure out, us here, small nation, like we are, uh, what we should do, we, I mean adults, the society, to stop this ingenuising our children. Ingenuizing. Is this ingenuizing? So, Hard in, work, other yeah. words, Probably, yeah. <laughs> in other words, stopping from making education a compliance process mm. to the existing norms of the society, mm. existing norms of learning, and actually uh, unlocking their potential. Mm. That's as simple as that. How to do it? I have no idea. But it's a simple start, simple <laughs> enough start at least. Yes, and then you, yeah. Yeah, I just was, I wanted to follow up. I, I was part of the group of um, 
vice rectors for education in Norway uh, in, on Monday. And then we had the student representative for all the students, and she was asking, you know, could you please dare? So kind of following up on that, how to do daring leadership, mm. to kind of open up. But I just want to comment on, I don't think we should say that it's the responsibility of the young people to fix this problem. I think we need to take the daring responsibility of actually listening right. to them and then kind of doing something. Tell you they will grow up. We will, we will be retired. They can take yeah, care of no, it. No, that's, you know, if there's no room for them. I know there's students coming up here later. Listen to what they are saying. Anthony, yeah. let me correct myself. Sorry, yeah. I think this is not about what we do to our kids. The question about learning for the future is what do we do to ourselves? Mm. Mm. The adults mm. here in the room. Mm. What do you mean with that? It's not about what we do to our children. Yeah, I understand. How we but teach them, yeah, but how yeah. we teach ourselves. Mm -hmm. So how do we relearn? Ah, so that we can yes. reform and help out. Okay, good. Now, please. Sorry. Your yes, sir. Uh, to my mind, uh, probably uh, in short, uh, it would be nice if we can spend enough time and to make student-centered studies, personalized uh, teaching and learning, flexible study time for them and for us professors. And, of course, uh, all kinds of uh, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and everything like that. And to my mind, uh, probably it uh, would be nice to return to the Plato's Academy, you know, where discussions and dialect approach was uh, uh, the main way to obtain knowledge. And uh, dialects and discussion in a free nature, um, a garden, you know, probably that uh, would be a very nice solution for the future. So I hear that... Looking uh, back, yeah. go to the future. Uh, but but what, what I also hear then is that we, we cannot have the same type of system we have today where we almost do factory work type of yes, assembly exactly. line That's type of, of education. Us. But uh, yes, uh, but um, uh, to my mind, the, the, we, the main thing we have to, to understand that uh, all those... Uh, digital things, digital stuff, but is uh, supportive. It must be just uh, for support, not for the, not for the, not in the center, you know, of the education system. What do you think about, the, let's just throw it out there. What if, uh, will we have classrooms yeah. 20 years from now? Something like uh, uh, Google, Google, uh, Google workplaces, or maybe a little bit like here, you know, uh, informal and uh, nice with uh, uh, right lights <laughs> and uh, right people around. So, so every 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 mm -hmm. opportunity, every learning is a stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a uh, stage uh, kind that. of actually, yes. Why not? Yes, I guess the words matter. Maybe we shouldn't call them classrooms any longer. No. Perhaps we should talk about study spaces. Yes. Or something like that. Spaces, I mean, maybe yes. there's a better word. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. yeah I'm don't just use asking. the word yes. classes. <laughs> it's uh, really terrifying our students. If I, if I look at it, how it's been for, for the last hundred or something years, it's, it's classroom, age by age by age, and you have to learn, learn, learn in order no. to do the test, 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 and no. then you go on. But 20 years from now, will we have that? You had a comment there. Uh, in some sense, I had a com comment, and maybe I can. Uh, from that point, uh, move on. But comment is that uh, I'm sure that definitely we will have, if not classrooms, we will have discussion rooms. Because uh, personal discussion, I think it's uh, a very important part of uh, any education, of any learning, uh, self-learning, teaching, and things like that. So I'm absolutely sure that in one way or another, we will have kind of uh, discussion with uh, students, professors, uh, small groups, larger groups. Uh, but uh, coming back to your initial question, uh, what uh, we can do here in this country, in Latvia, and maybe uh, what kind of advantage we have here. And I think that we have one uh, distinct advantage. Uh, because politicians don't like to think in, in the way that we are a small country, at least not to uh, vocalize that we are a small country, mm -hmm. but actually we are a small country. Mm -hmm. And in small country, we can have uh, very dynamic systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we learned from our personal experience, as we learned from uh, talks today, um, education is a very dynamic system from one hand. Uh, 
educational establishments, uh, I'm sorry to say, are very conservative and moving very often rather slowly. And to balance these things, uh, it's much easier to balance these things in a small country. We can be much more flexible than large ships, which is very uh, hard to, to, to change direction to course of large ship. If we are rather small boat, I, I would say, we can very flexibly uh, adjust our system to uh, needs to needs of uh, education and one need which probably is to keep this balance because it was several times uh, mentioned today that a uh, key point of, of, uh, in education is imagination, uh, ability to, uh, to think outside the box and things like that, but there is a counterbalance uh, because there is real life real structure in this life. And uh, imagination is a good thing, and I'm not arguing against uh, 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 imagination in any way, but to balance these things. And for that, I think that uh, science education is extremely important. And you mentioned myself as being a quantum physicist. And about quantum physics, we very often are thinking that in, in quantum physics, everything is possible. For example, Schrodinger cat can be alive and dead at the same time. <laughs> and if we are thinking in this way, then easily you can have feelings that uh, if this is possible in quantum mechanics, then anything is possible. And not anything is possible, I am afraid to say. And uh, science education is uh, teaching to think about almost impossible things precisely, even mathematically precisely. And this balance should be uh, kept, and I, I think this is challenges of a future education system. And in small country, it can be addressed in the most, most efficient way. Okay, so we are a speedboat here. We can be fast. We don't have to be the slow cruise ship. That's what you're saying. No. And then, yeah. you know, yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I just kind of want to, because I do re research in professions, and we have discussions about what's the future of profession, and then we have a discussion about where does knowledge reside in society? Where is it? So I think maybe going through the talks thinking about some young people having a lot of insights in areas, where is that? It's not within the hierarchy of the institution. So I, I agree with you so much. We need to kind of try to tear down these institutions and kind of get knowledge at the center of what we're doing. And if we do that, I think it's important to think about, I had the talk yesterday uh, about this, but we think a lot about platforms, digital platforms, and you're asking what are we going to do with the physical environment of the no, just, Yeah, one, yeah. one question. Yeah. It's like, it could be the classroom, it could be something else. Like, mm -hmm. What if we think about the physical environment as a platform? How do we use, utilize that kind of space to get people to interact and share knowledge, if knowledge is at the center, in the best possible way? And then how do we integrate and think about the digital layer and the physical layer and how they interact and how we can kind of think about that in a different way. Just my, just the thought I have. So yeah. when I looked at the list of the things that they talked about that are, you know, humanity or human revolution and all that, knowledge was not part of it. They, they talked about compassion and empathy and imagination and creativity and all those things. They didn't say knowledge. Why, do you think? Do, don't we need knowledge in the future of education? Uh. So I think that looking uh, of my knowledge of technology, it's really good kind of when we have a lot of data, but at the periphery of kind of coming up with new ways of thinking about things that I would call knowledge, you use a lot of information, but you kind of need to distill that, think mm. about that mm. change. To, to me, that's at a different level. You have data, you have information, then you have knowledge. That's something else. And I yeah, still okay. think so we knowledge need that. Knowledge is kind of understanding data and information. Like, and then competence is, is applying yeah. knowledge then somehow. Right, right. Uh, you first and then you. Yes. Uh, yeah. you. Uh, when we are thinking about knowledge and how much knowledge we need and what kind of knowledge, uh, Actually, today and in this type of discussions, we are sometimes thinking a little bit schematically. And this is uh, my feeling, if we are looking in that in a little bit in schematic way, we have people who are thinking. Mm -hmm. And we are people who are uh, knowing. Mm -hmm. And this is two types of personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are asking me a question and I'm a people who, uh, person who is knowing, I'm thinking, where is the answer? In which book it was? Uh, should I Google that? Uh, and on the opposite side of the spectrum, if you are asking me some question, I'm saying, uh, no, I don't know, uh, want to know anything from books. I'm smart. I will uh, create answer myself. Mm -hmm. And actually, the 
um, and very often uh, people are in one of these categories and in rather distinctive way. And if we have kind of a synthetic personality, and this is probably what we would uh, like to have in the education system, somebody who knows certain amount of facts because you cannot be creative and um, mm. find answers if you don't know Nothing. some some basic facts, mm. and then you are uh, starting from these facts and you are thinking. Uh, and if you are uh, balancing all these things, then I think that uh, you will be achieving the best results. So, so the future is to, to be able to extract those data and, and have some creative and, and thinking around it so we can you know, do something with it. Yeah, <clears throat> I actually think that the um, future is right now because what we are talking right now, this is uh, what is needed. I'm a representative of the employers here because uh, I, I work in the company who employs a lot of people. And what we could see is that problem solving and analytical thinking with uh, technologic, technologic enabling skills is what is required. There is no, I mean, on the knowledge side, we could give certain knowledge which is needed for the profession to work with, but if you do not have those basic skills, uh, you know, being a human being, working for the society, I think this is most important. And when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking not about whom we need as a student or what type of the sort of um, uh, personalities or the human being we need as a result of it, I'm questioning myself as well. What kind of teachers do we need for those people to strive to what we have and what we need to do? Because this is the first will come. Teachers will come the first and then the pupils will follow what they are given uh, as a result of the whole process. And this is something which I think we need to concentrate more on what it, who is those people, whom they are, what skills they need to have, how do we bring them to those skills, and what type of investment as a society, I should say, we need to bring to them, and what kind of mandate, social mandate as well, we need to give to them. Oh, a lot to think about here. I'm going to leave yes, yes, most of you rest in your hands. Let me take it uh, first, you, Daniels, and then, and then you. So. First Thank me you. or, no, sorry. or uh, Daniels? We'll start with Daniels first, because oh. he rest his hand before you. Yes. Uh, well, you see, the, I'll come back to what Zlata just finished off with. Now, uh, the name of the conference is 2050. It's a pretty long time mm. by today's standards. And, and, and what kind of world we will live in mm. by that time. It could be a happy place, but it mm. might not be mm. as well. It could be a dystopian place with, you know, extreme inequalities, useless fake jobs and miserable existence for masses. It could be a place of, you know, robots gone wild. All sorts of things on Black Mirror, which was a little bit ridiculed earlier. Mm. But it could happen. And there are good reasons for that. Again, human nature and, and an inability to control technology that we have created and the, this massive sort of replication of the bad side, the dark side of the human nature, right? Yeah, that's why I didn't start with that question. <laughs> but now back to skills. And, and what I'd like to, to make a bridge to what Zlata finished off saying is who will create that future? It's us in the room, the teachers, the school directors here in the room. Now, what, what should we be doing? And it really seems that we should be building for ourselves and the children a learning around three big things themes. How do we deal with ourselves, ourselves and as human beings, the human skills, psychology if you like, human psychology. Uh, secondly, how do we master technology? This is about STEM. I mean, this was the point made earlier is that so few of us actually know how transistors work, right? Not let alone AI. And last but not least, uh, how do we learn about the place we live in, this real world, high touch versus high tech, the ecosystem, of the planet, the interaction with, uh, with this, uh, this space where we live in. So I guess those are the three key areas in which we should be developing our learning, both ourselves and for our kids, and uh, perhaps we'll do fine. Where in all this did you put art, for instance? Oh. Human. 
being so that's human. part of being human. Okay. Being human. Okay. It sealed my that. mind. Yeah. Oh, was that what you, <laughs> yes. yeah, okay, yeah. Because I didn't hear it. I think that's kind yes, of, yes. what is it that we do? What right? makes yeah. us human? All right. Okay. In that case, really so cool. yes, uh, if if I may, uh, I, I was resonated very much uh, with the thesis about uh, unlocking skills and uh, unlocking minds by by said by Mr. Uh, Gerd uh, Leonard uh, when he uh, mentioned uh, this abbreviation of STEM and uh, writes H uh, E C I humanity ethics uh, creativity imagination and uh, I would like to invite probably to make it more simple and just to include the letter A as arts in the abbreviation of STEM. And then we would uh, uh, have uh, those, uh, instead of a STEM, we, we have STEAM. I know that uh, some guys, uh, they had it. Uh, you get an applaud for that, is it? They had done it uh, some, uh, some years before. And uh, to my mind, uh, whatever, Whatever kind of arts you want, you can include it. So, uh, music, dance, singing, painting, design, writing, drama, performative arts, or whatever. Uh, everything fits. And uh, because arts are about creativity, about imagination, and most of all, we need empathy. And those are, uh, to my mind, uh, three absolutely indispensable qualities if we are talking about a future innovative and values-based um, and, 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 and really future-oriented model of, of education, including higher education. Thank, Thank you, you for mentioning values. Yeah. Thank you. I yeah. should yes. have said that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We the, are. the values as well. Uh, yeah. it, it, because we are living in a time of uh, really challenging, uh, values challenging, yes. Times. I just want to follow up on that. I have three kids that go to the IB uh, programs and they use their first five years to implement values. They are never measured on kind of their knowledge dimension. They're more val measured on values if they're innovative, if they're caring, if they're b able to build relations, which is a totally way different way of teaching kids kind of how to deal. And then so they have the these solution. units where they're like, me and the society, this is one of the first units that they have. So it yeah. very well resonates with how can we think more like that? I know there are universities out there that actually measures values of students when they yeah. enter and the values of the student when they exit their education so, rather than just measuring the knowledge or the, some kind of skill that they have. So it's just, I, I really, it resonates a lot with me this way of thinking. Yes, yeah. thank you. One, one thing that I've noticed, and now I'm taking you back home to kind of where we are today, even though we talk about, you know, where do we want to be, uh, is that it's really hard for the system to handle that type of, of grading, because everything is a grade. You need the grade in order to get to high school, you need a yeah. grade in order to get to university. And I remember talking to one guy who, who is a friend of mine who is uh, keynoting on, on lean, lean productions and stuff like that. And he said that there was a hospital in Sweden, uh, which tried a completely new approach. If somebody came in with some sort of fuzzy disease, they didn't know what it was, an armada of doc doctors from different disciplines checked that person out, you know, yeah. what is, you know, to find out what was wrong and then fix it. And it, it, it turns out that they were much quicker in solving the patient's problem. Mm -hmm. uh, they were much less stressed because, you know, again, you know, they, they fixed it and so on. And, and they, they, was, they, were, they were just successful. The problem was, and they, they went back into the old way, you know, one at a time, wait three months, one at a time, and, and, uh, because they couldn't handle it from an accountant perspective. Mm -hmm. Who will take the cost? Mm. So they skipped it based on that. And I can see some similarities. Gert, for instance, said, how about having one class, one theme called climate, and then we take every discipline into it. But how do you grade it? It seems to be a problem for us because we have... Uh, topics, you know, this teacher teaches English, this teacher teaches yes. uh, mathematics, uh, that's what I do, I don't do anything else, I, I do my thing. And that's the system we are built today. So if we look at it again, 20, 10 years in the future, w will that even exist in the future, is my question. And if it doesn't, how do we solve that issue? 
Who wants to? Yes, and then I, can, I can yeah. start because we yeah. ha- kind of had a little bit of a similar discussion on Monday uh, regarding like the role of the. I think you were touching upon it, the role of the educator. Yes, you might not even call it teacher. Might it might be a facilitator. So actually, these kind of roles, being a professor, we need to think about our role. We no longer know the most because there are students in the class that have Googled and, or, and looked at YouTube videos and they have looked at the best in the world and maybe I haven't have time to do that, so I'm no longer the expert in my field, to be honest. So how to deal with that, that's a real change for all the professors in our sector to deal with that. We can no longer sit and think that we know the most about what we're supposed to know the most My son about. says he, he, he hasn't learned anything from his English teacher. <laughs> Yeah. Everything was from YouTube, he says. Can I just come up one more thing? Because I yeah. think we have one representative. This is all about the demand out there, the companies, the businesses. What are they asking for? Are they asking for grades or are they asking for people? It's like, yeah, yeah uh, and you know, I think uh, for us, we see people as the value. This is not, I mean, everything which could be modernized, uh, robotized, uh, is already there. I mean, uh, companies are going for it and doing as a matter of their existence. But what they cannot solve is the human factor. So they, uh, you know, the employees, the people who are coming, they are coming with the backgrounds which they are getting. The only thing which employers could do is upskill them throughout the life of the career, depending on what is happening in the economy, what's new innovations are coming, what's everything, we are adjusting. But I think what is, what is primary is those basic skills in terms of lifelong learning, uh, you know, digital abilities of the people, um, working in teams and being human being and really this uh, problem solving and, uh, you know, uh, big picture, you know, thinking models is something which is actually needs to come as the result of the beginning educational process. And then it would develop because this is something which is maybe sometimes is too late. It takes too much time. It's not anymore uh, what um, employees are needing. So this is just coming back what you are saying. There are some certain skills which we expect for every person to have in order to give them more. Hmm. Thank you. Ruta, you had something and then... Uh, yes, uh, I, 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 I could continue. Um, in, 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 um, answering your, your questions, uh, question uh, regarding those uh, disciplinary um, approaches, uh, uh, actually, we are kind of victims of, of a disciplinary approach, which came from the modernism time. And uh, life is not <laughs> disciplinary. Life is uh, not too uh, complicated to be to to to, to be approached from uh, from uh, from uh, one side, from uh, one uh, type of uh, knowledge. And I like very much uh, the philosopher uh, Wilhelm uh, Dilke. Uh, uh, he, he, in the very beginning of the 20th 20, uh, 20 century, in the end of uh, 19th century, he was one uh, of the first who um, invited uh, uh, everybody to think about uh, and study uh, how he co- uh, called nexus of life, uh, which means attachment uh, uh, to life and to do it uh, interdisciplinary and especially transdisciplinary to, to, to putting together, uh, as I said, and as a colleague mentioned, uh, different kinds, uh, kinds of knowledges, uh, including traditional knowledges, not academic. Uh, uh, probably you have to um, look more careful and, and uh, probably implement in our programs uh, this transdisciplinary approach. Uh, I mean, uh, to make uh, bridges uh, between uh, society and uh, academic people, and uh, not, uh, not even mention uh, between arts and, and uh, sciences and things like that. Uh, to my mind, uh, it would be very, very um, helpful uh, so we'll see, we'll see mode of teaching in the future. Yeah, in the future, yes. You have something you want to comment um, about. 
Yeah, I think that we now discussing, uh, I would say, these soft skills and values which we are uh, expecting from uh, younger generation <laughs> and how to, I wouldn't say even teach, probably develop these mm -hmm. skills. And uh, we have discussed today uh, in detail about the role of uh, teachers and professors. And I think this is a crucial point. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you are teaching, I don't know, physics, mathematics, which is a little bit technical way, mm -hmm. uh, you can even um, uh, imagine that this can be taught by uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a little bit maybe uh, uh, exaggerating, but, but a little bit in that direction. When we are speaking about values, I don't think that you can do it uh, other way than by your uh, personal example. And then it's, we are coming to the point how to get uh, in schools teachers who are really inspiring, who are uh, role models, who are leaders. And uh, I guess that it, it's a problem not only in Latvia. I, I am learning that it's a problem in many countries, uh, that uh, we would like to have more um, inspiring teachers uh, in schools, how, how to do that, because, um, and especially uh, probably in lower grades, because everybody, if we are looking back in our uh, school years, at what point we decided uh, what will be our future, in what, what direction we will be going, usually it's uh, becoming and happening not in high school, definitely not at the university level. Uh, now we were often thinking that we should offer more specific uh, study places, for example, in, in engineering at the university level and we will solve the problem, lack of engineering uh, or engineers. Usually it's not working this way because it's happening much, uh, it's much uh, younger age and how to get these people there. Uh, because it's only half joke. I remember one rector's conference and uh, one of my colleagues defined three pillars on which university education rests. And you should listen to that. Mm. First pillar is professors. Mm. Second pillar is professors. Mm. And the third third no pillar is professors. <laughs> uh, so exactly. it means uh, and, uh, that teachers, uh, educators, this is a very important kind of uh, part of the system and if we uh, will manage to get uh, most inspiring people as I said uh, in schools problem will be solved mm -hmm. if it still be somehow under privileged profession in eyes of younger people mm -hmm. uh, we can develop any uh, teaching methods any teaching materials and problem will, will still be there mm -hmm. so so there was Let's two, two about... parts of this as I can hear. One is AI. Will, will, will we have some sort of help, help from technology? Mm -hmm. And the other one is, do we have inspiring, ins inspirational teachers? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, we, if, we, if we go into both of them, like in the future, there is a limited resource of people who teach, mm -hmm. but there could be an infinite number of bots helping us. Mm -hmm. I, I see already now uh, cases in Korea where you have a, a bot saying, um, uh, talking to students so that they can get the grammar right. It, it's, it's already there, like a trial out. What if we have one bot for one student that helps them throughout their own kind of learning curve in the future? Do we even need first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, or should we just follow one person at a time? No. What, what I meant actually is that uh, bots cannot teach values, it's my feeling. And our society is based on values. And if we have uh, big problems in society, usually it's a problem of values. And so teachers, uh, somebody asked during a presentation what will be uh, forever in education. I would say teachers, professors, always will be kind of a crucial um, part of education system. But then we need to help them uh, in, in the way the processes are built. We need to help those teachers. Otherwise, we will keep on going exactly like we do today. Sure. So there must be some sort of new process in place, I guess. Yes? I guess I will be reiterating my earlier point, but just to, uh, to build on, on what Professor Auzin just said, it seems key uh, to figure out the way we can help the educators to learn, to support, to enable, to provide the means, the motivation, the inescapability 
of the fact, inevitability of the fact that educators uh, need to uh, learn for the future. That is the key to actually helping our children learn, actually learning from them as well. So I guess the big question here is, is, is this, how do we, the educating class, the educating age, actually get to change? And uh, this old adage of, of the culture eats uh, strategy for breakfast, same here. And how do we do it in a world that is so fast-paced, changed? Everything happens so extremely fast. It's the exponential change is going on. How can we even talk about developing a learning and education system 20 years from now when we don't have a clue of what that future would look like? Yes? Yes, so first of all, I think it's important right now that we stop some of the words that we use. So we talk about, for example, in Norway, teaching duty. Like teaching you, duty. you have a okay, teaching yeah. duty, <laughs> yeah. that's okay. not a duty, that's a huge opportunity because probably going forward, it's not like given that you're allowed to stand in front of people and actually communicate stuff, right? Like we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, and then I had another point that I, I didn't catch. Yeah, and then, yeah, we're saying that everything is moving so fast. I've been in this game, I do a lot of speaking engagement. Maybe sometimes also we should think about, like one of the speakers were asking, like what should not change? Yes. Like, yes. what do we have the right not to change as humans? Like, the interaction, being in communication with the, each other. I remember some years ago, we were doing a strategy process at our university, and we had one of the consultancies coming in, showing the future of education. And it was like this one individual person moving around with an AI and holograms, <laughs> just on their own, totally by themselves. Like, you know, we're talking a lot about loneliness or mm -hmm. somebody talked about solitude, which is being on your own, that you like to be on your own, but loneliness is the other side of being alone and you don't want to be alone. Like, we need to think about all of these things as well, I think. So one bot and one person, great, but how to kind of, you know, uh, nourish as a compliment, we, yeah. As a compliment a nourish, to, to the whole yeah. reflection discussion. Nourish what discussion we don't want to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. The, the Plato way is still valid. Yes. I, I just wanted to add, if we look at and compare with the businesses as we are, we are living in uncertainty. Everything is changing in a business. Clients are changing, markets are changing, value chains are changing, everything is changing. So, and I think I agree with you. And it, if we ask ourselves the question, so what we could do, and I think in the time of uncertainty, when we don't really know how the elephant look like in the future, yeah, what color it will be, how big it will be, and so forth. I think the current, what we could do is really to solve and start to solve really important problems right now and doing it every time. Not just every problem, but really the problem which contributes to the brighter something, the brighter education and so forth. And I, and I do believe that without really going from the strategy towards real actions which need to be taken every day by each of us, working of what is right in this particular situation is something which when the future will probably will not come. And this comes very well with the citations which we heard. Yeah. But, but Pertu said one thing that was really interesting when it comes to you know, what we do. He said, uh, uh, we, if we, the worst thing that can happen is that we succeed in something that doesn't matter. Yeah. So, so, so still having the vision and then taking the first steps. So final question to all of you, one at a time. I can start with you then. What would, we, would be our homework when we leave this conference? What, what do you say is, the, is one of those call to actions from your side? Uh, from my side, I think uh, I will be very rational. I think we need to go back, uh, understand um, uh, whether our approach to the current education is right or not we need to understand what are the five years short-term actions which we need, and we as the society need to allocate the right resource to really invest in it. Because if we are saying there is a you know, will, but there is no budget to do the things, this is not this is not going to happen. So we need to have both combinations. We need to have will, and we need to have resources to run this. Okay, so we, we need to dream, but we also need to project manage yeah, <laughs> something. Okay, definitely. so we need both. Good. What would be your call to action? <sighs> yeah, I think I've said it already. Um, I think that we have to figure out how to support our educators. 
in doing two things uh, and balancing them. Uh, in the times of uncertainty, and this is going to be uncertain for a long time, uh, the only thing that w is worth doing is, is building capacity to deal with uncertainty, adaptability, okay. openness, ability to learn at any age. I mean, obvious, right? I mean, everybody said it. Now, how do we do this in our school system, in our university system? We still haven't figured out the STEM. We're still struggling with STEM in this country, and we, you know, that's more or less clear what we need to do. But what, how do we figure out uh, becoming more humane? How do we do this H-E-C-I, or the arts part? And I guess that's the question I'm throwing to the audience. How do we make our current education system more humane? How do we build that human capacity for ourselves and for the kids? Yeah, so that's a call to action. It's a question, really. Balancing STEM with H-E-C-I, yes. H -E -C -I, yes. We go on. What yes, be and, uh, and uh, in that case, and um, I would uh, I would like to to invite uh, not to forget three humanistic basics, and uh, it is the simplicity for the planet resources saving, sincerity for saving our mental health, and uh, to ensure the personal integrity of uh, of a young people. And the third one, uh, to my mind, uh, quite important, is uh, humility. Uh, with the reference uh, to Drew Faust, uh, she's uh, a historian and, and former president of Harvard University. And she said very nicely, I quote, humility is a prerequisite for becoming educated, end of quote. And uh, without uh, those uh, basics, uh, uh, I think it's uh, no possible to obtain any knowledge, uh, including, uh, including academic, of course. And humbleness is a precondition to, to, to admit that uh, our knowledge is uh, incomplete. And uh, after that goes curiosity and willpower to know the world around better. All right, it's, uh, it's the paraphrasing of Socrates saying, I, the only thing I know is yes, I don't know. Exactly. And then if yeah. I don't have that attitude yes. and then try to learn, okay. But yes. you have to admit it. What's your uh, call to action? If I would like to uh, make it very brief, so I think that we uh, need uh, many more uh, leaders in our society. And it means that at young age in uh, grammar school, we should find ways how to develop uh, leadership, how to make young uh, kids brave enough, uh, if they think so, to, to swim against current, mm -hmm. to speak out if they don't agree uh, even with their teachers. Mm -hmm. We know that it's not easy, mm -hmm. uh, but if we will not be developing these skills in young, young people, then we will not have a dynamic society, and this is not easy, we know. We know from our kids, we know from uh, our experience in classroom, that to contradict your teacher and professor is, needs some bravery. And at the same time, not to make a, this as a, a style to contradict everything, to, to stand with both fields, uh, feet in reality, but still, if you have opinion, to express this opinion. Yeah, with, with some sort of care, I guess, but I see what you mean. You cannot be, uh, you know, saying, uh, talking against the teacher in every sense and every time, because yeah. then, then it's just being obstructive, which is another thing. Brave is good. Okay. Yes, I want to continue on the being brave, because I think that right now, if you look 20 years into the future, Latvia could be really great. You know, just kind of keep that, like this vision of what we can be, keep that. And then at the same time, whenever you see somebody who's trying to do something that could kind of lead you into becoming a, you know, a flexible, developing, educational nation, let them speak, let them, you know, if you're a professor, if you're a leader, if you see one of your professor trying something new, you know, go ahead, like open it up and allow people to be brave. Uh, both the professors as well, so leadership, well, don't do education that way, we shouldn't be saying that. We should open first for the professors and maybe they will allow for the kids to to express their opinions. Yeah. Which is a good, yeah, we're giving an applause, we give all of them an applause actually. <laughs> so, this is the last question I had. Thank you so much to every one of you. Uh, really interesting.